All right, guys, in the last chapter, we got some mysterious hints about what's going to be coming up in the story. Um, Miss Spink and Miss Forcible gave Coraline a really uh, mysterious message about how she's in danger. They gave her a stone with a hole in the middle. Um, the crazy old man upstairs um, told Coraline that her uh, rats told her to not go through the door. So you can probably all guess what's going to happen in chapter 3. All right, chapter three. The next day, the sun shone, and Coraline's mother took her into the nearest large town to buy clothes for school. They dropped her father off at the railway station. He was going into London for the day to see some people. Coraline waved him goodbye. They went to the department store to buy the school clothes. Coraline saw some day glow green gloves she liked a lot. Her mother refused to buy them for her, preferring instead to buy white socks, navy blue school uniform, underpants, four gray blouses, and a dark gray, gray skirt. But mom, everybody at school's got gray blouses and everything. Nobody's got green gloves. I could be the only one. Her mother ignored her. She was talking to the shop assistant. They were talking about which kind of sweater to get for Caroline, Coraline, and were agreeing that the best thing to do would be to get one that was embarrassingly large and baggy in the hopes that one day she might grow into it. Coraline wandered off and looked at the display of Wellington boots, shaped like frogs and ducks and rabbits. Then she wandered back. Coraline, oh, there you are. Where on earth were you? Uh, I was kidnapped by aliens, said Coraline. They came down from outer space with ray guns, but I fooled them by wearing a wig and laughing in a foreign accent, and I escaped. Yes, dear. Now, I think you could do with some more hair clubs, don't you? No. Well, let's just say half a dozen to be on the safe side, said her mother. Coraline didn't say anything. In the car on the way back home, Coraline said, What's in that empty flat? I don't know. Nothing, I expect. It probably looks like our flat before we moved in. Empty rooms. Do you think you could get into it from our flat? Not unless you can walk through bricks, dear. Oh. They got, some, they got home around lunchtime. The sun was shining, although the day was cold. Coraline's mother looked into the fridge and found a sad little tomato and a piece of cheese with green stuff growing in it. There was only a crust in the bread bin. I had better dash down to the shops and get some fish fingers or something, said her mother. Do you want to come? Nah, said Coraline. Suit yourself, said her mother, and left. Then she came back and got her purse and car keys and went out again. Coraline was bored. She flipped through a book her mother was reading about native people in a distant country. How every day they would take pieces of white silk and draw on them in wax, then dip the silks in dye, then draw on them more in wax and dye, and then some more then boil the wax out in hot water, and then finally throw the now beautiful clothes on a fire and burn them to ashes. It seemed particularly pointless to Coraline, but she hoped that the people enjoyed it. She was still bored, and her mother wasn't home yet. Coraline got a chair and pushed it over to the kitchen door. She climbed onto the chair and reached up. She got down, then she got a broom from the broom cupboard. She climbed back on the chair again and reached up with the broom. Chink! She climbed down from the chair and picked up the keys. She smiled triumphantly. Then she leaned the broom against the wall and went into the drawing room. The family did not use a drawing room. They had inherited the furniture from Coraline's grandmother, along with a wooden coffee table, a side table, a heavy glass ashtray, and the oil painting of a bowl of fruit. Coraline could never work out why anyone would want to paint a bowl of fruit. Other than that, the room was empty. There were no knickknacks on the mantelpiece, no statues or clocks, nothing that made it feel, un that made it feel comfortable or lived in. The old black key felt colder than any of the others. She pushed it into the keyhole. It turned smoothly with a satisfying clunk. Coraline stopped and listened. She knew she was doing something wrong. And she was trying to listen for her mother coming back, but she heard nothing. Then Coraline put her hand on the doorknob and turned it, and finally she opened the door. It opened onto a dark hallway. The bricks had gone as if they'd never been there. There was a cold, musty smell coming through the open doorway. It smelled like something very old and very slow. Coraline went to the door. She wondered what the empty flat would be like if that was where the corridor led. Coraline walked down the corridor uneasily. There was something very familiar about it. The carpet beneath her feet was the same carpet they had in her flat. The wallpaper was the same wallpaper they had. The picture hanging in the hall was the same that they had hanging in their hallway at home. She knew where she was. She was in her own home. She hadn't left. 
She shook her head, confused. She stared at the picture hanging on the wall. No, it wasn't exactly the same. The picture they had in their hall hallway showed a boy in old-fashioned clothes staring at some bubbles. But now the expression on his face was different. He was looking at the bubbles as if he was planning to do something very nasty indeed to them. And there was something peculiar about his eyes. Coraline stared at his eyes, trying to figure out what exactly was different. She almost had it when somebody said, Coraline... It sounded like her mother. Coraline went into the kitchen where the voice came had come from. A woman stood in the kitchen with her back to Coraline. She looked a little like Coraline's mother, only only her skin was white as paper. Only she was taller and thinner. Only her fingers were too long, and they never stopped moving, and her dark red fingernails were curved and sharp. Coraline, the mother, the woman said, is that you? And then she turned around. Her eyes were big black buttons. Lunchtime, Coraline, said the woman. Uh, who are you? asked Coraline. I'm your other mother, said the woman. Go and tell your other father that lunch is ready. She opened the door at the of, of the oven. Suddenly, Coraline realized how hungry she was. It smelled wonderful. Well, go on. Coraline went down the hall to where her father's study was. She opened the door. There was a man in there sitting at the keyboard with his back to her. Hello, said Coraline. I, I mean, she said to say that lunch is ready. The man turned around. His eyes were buttons, big and black and shiny. Hello, Coraline, he said. I'm starving. He got up and went, into, went with her into the kitchen. They sat at the kitchen table, and Coraline's mother brought, home, brought them a lunch. A huge golden brown roasted chicken, fried potatoes, tiny green peas. Caroline sh Coraline shoved the food into her mouth. It tasted wonderful. We've been waiting for you for a long time, said Coraline's other father. For me? Yes, said the other mother. It wasn't the same here without you, but we knew you'd arrive one day, and we could be a proper family. Would you like some more chicken? It was the best chicken that Coraline had ever eaten. Her mother sometimes made chicken, but it was not but it was always out of packets of or frozen and was very dry, and it never tasted of anything. When Coraline's father cooked chicken, he brought real chicken, but he did strange things to it, like stewing it in wine or stuffing it with prunes or baking it in in pastry, and Caroline would always refuse to touch it on principle. She took some more chicken. I didn't know I had another mother, said Coraline cautiously. Of course you do. Everyone does, said the other mother, her black button eyes gleaming. After lunch, I thought you might like to play in your room with the rats. Uh, the rats? From upstairs. Coraline had never seen a rat except on television. She was quite looking forward to it. This was turning out to be a very interesting day after all. After lunch, her other parents did the washing up and Coraline went down the hall to her other bedroom. It was different from her bedroom at home. For a start, it was painted in an off-putting shade of green and a peculiar shade of pink. Coraline decided that she wouldn't want to have to sleep in there, but that the color scheme was an awful lot more interesting than her own bedroom. There were all sorts of remarkable things in there she'd never seen before. Wind-up angels that fluttered around the bedroom like startled sparrows, books with pictures that writhed and crawled and shimmered, little dinosaur skulls that chattered their teeth as she passed, a whole toy box filled with wonderful toys. This is more like it, thought Coraline. She looked out of the window. Outside, the view was the same one she saw from her own bedroom. Trees, fields, and beyond them, on the horizon, distant purple hills. Something black scurried across the floor and vanished under the bed. Coraline got down on her knees and looked under the bed. Fifty little red eyes stared back at her. Uh, hello, said Coraline. Are, are you the rats? They came out from under the bed, blinking their eyes in the light. They had short, soot black fur, little red eyes, pink paws like tiny hands, and pink hairless tails like long, smooth worms. Uh, can you talk? she asked. The largest, blackest of the rats shook its head. It had an unpleasant sort of smile, Coraline thought. Well, asked Coraline, what do you do? The rats form a circle. Then they began to climb on top of each other, carefully but swiftly, until they had formed a pyramid with the largest rat on top. The rats began to sing in high, whispery voices. We have teeth and we have tails. We have tails and we have eyes. We were here before you fell. You will be here when we rise. It wasn't a pretty song. Coraline was sure she'd heard it before, or something like it, although she was unable to remember exactly where. Then the pyramid fell apart and the rats scampered fast and black toward the door. 
The other crazy old man upstairs was standing in the doorway, holding a tall black hat in his hands. The rat scampered up him, burrowing into his pockets, into his shirt, up his trouser legs, down his neck. The largest rat climbed onto the old man's shoulders, swung up on the long gray mustache, past the big black button eyes, and onto the top of the man's head. In seconds, the only evidence that the rats were there at all were the restless lumps under the man's clothes, forever sliding from place to place across him. And there was still the largest rat who stared down with glittering red eyes at Coraline from the man's head. The old man put his hat on, and the last rat was gone. Hello, Coraline, said the elder, other old man upstairs. I heard you were there, over here. It is time for the rats to have their dinner, but you can come up with me if you'd like and watch them feed. There was something hungry in the old man's button eyes that made Coraline feel uncomfortable. Uh, no thank you, she said. I'm going to go outside to explore. The old man nodded very slowly. Coraline could hear the rats whispering to each other, although she could not tell what they were saying. She was not certain that she wanted to know what they were saying. Her other parents stood in the kitchen doorway as she walked down the corridor, smiling, identical smiles, and waving slowly. Have a nice time outside, her, said her other mother. We'll just be here waiting for you to come back, said her other father. When Coraline got to the front door, she turned back and looked at them. They were still watching her and waving and smiling. Coraline walked outside and down the steps. All right, guys, so that's the end of chapter three. I want you to start wondering um, what's different about this other world that Coraline has stepped into. Is this real? Is this a dream? Uh, do you think it's a good idea for her to stay here? Uh, what would you do? I mean, if you had parents who didn't have time for you and didn't give you the food that you wanted and didn't really listen to you, and then you suddenly come to this whole new world where everything's kind of like almost seems perfect, what would you do? Would you want to stay here or would you think that something is too, uh, something is suspicious? So I'll see you guys in the next chapter, chapter four. Uh, peace out.